Thanks for coming back with us on Series 3 on our cruise on the Inner Passage to Hubbard Glacier. I will never forget the Hubbard Glacier. It's a magnificent glacier, but I don't want to spend the whole time on that one. I'd like to uh, take you away so you don't have to look at the ice only and show you the glaciers in different parts of the world. So we're going to hop around a little bit with the glaciers. This movie is going to uh, cover two cruise ship trips up the Inner Passage and traveling Highway number 37, the uh, Alaska Highway and through Alaska, mainly Alaska and British Columbia, and four glaciers. We'll first uh, cover the cruise ship that we took up the Inner Passage this year. And then after that, we'll be taking Highway 37. We said we're going to cover four glaciers, but we also did the one in Denali and in uh, Alaska Highway or up in Alaska. Uh, a lot of the places, the mountains are just covered with them. Also in British Columbia around Stewart. We also went to Greenland. They got lots of glaciers there. While in Greenland, we, the cruise ship was going to leave, so we didn't get time to get out over the glaciers, but we got some pictures of them. The ice that the Titanic hit was from Greenland. Yakushvin, hopefully I pronounced that right, is a glacier in Greenland, and it's the fastest glowing glacier in the world. The Yakushvin glacier is growing and expected to continue growing. It's July, but we both got to stand on a little piece of glacier ice. Okay, we left uh, Greenland or back in British Columbia. We may be in Telegraph Creek here, but we don't have uh, a range ride down the river to Wrangell, Alaska. I hope that uh, in the future we can make arrangements to take a boat down the Stikeen and go to Wrangell, Alaska. There's some 300 uh, glaciers along the way there. So we got a lot of glaciers up in the north. I picked out the names of a few of the bigger ones like South Sawyer, Rats Glacier Stikine, Kate Needle Stikine, Lower uh, Dow's Glacier, Mount St. Dieter, and Laconte Glacier. That's only a few and I hope that I come close to pronouncing them right. We did Glacier Bay with the Princess Cruise Line some years ago. Okay, we're off the Yellowhead Highway on Highway 37, known as the Stuart Cassiar Highway, heading north. You're going to see lots of uh, glaciers now. This is Highway 37. We're just coming up to the Mesiaden Junction of Highway 37 and Highway 37A that goes into Stuart. Maybe 37A, but uh, we're going to be coming to Bear Glacier soon. Oh, there's the bears. The glacier should be coming shortly. This is the Bear Glacier near Stewart. This picture was taken in 1975, but i got to tell you that uh, it has uh, receded a great deal since then, so this one is getting smaller. We now are passing through Stewart, and we're going to Hyder, Alaska, and then we're coming back into Canada to, for the Salmon Glacier. This is the road that uh, the aero trucks hauled the ore on, and they had the buses haul into Grand Duke. I was a mechanic, used to do work on those trucks. A crew bus had uh, bent in the oil pan and broke the oil pump in one of these tunnels on uh, a Detroit diesel engine. I went up and had to weld it up and put it back on to get the crew back home that night. Not sure if this was the tunnel. Before leaving Stewart, I just wanted to show you their playground. That's a snowmobile. You only see the skis sticking out. Oh, and this is Hannah Pass, just past the uh, Mesiaden. A lot of snow there yet. We're now traveling 37, but the other way, and we're going up towards Dees. This is only a single lane road at this particular time, so they're trying to open up the other lane. I had a rad hose go in my car here once and thought I was going to spend the night. But a good friend of mine came out with another hose that we improvised and got on, so I got going. Making some good time, we're in Dees Lake now. Some of this was covered in Series 2, so we're going to move along fairly fast, and we're now already at Dees Lake. From Dees Lake, 16 miles down the Telegraph Road, you're going to come to a sign that says 16 Mile Cabin. That's a good sign, your smoke coming out of the hot tub. And we're going to be following the Stikine River 
on the, uh, the Telegraph Road down to Telegraph Creek in Glenora. This is my daughter and son-in-law's home and their cabins. They have did some great work here. The cabins are beautiful. He's just starting up his sawmill. The gray-haired guy with coveralls on is me. The sawmill comes in handy out there where they're at. That's John, my son-in-law, on the sawmill. I'm quite proud of him as far as his woodworking skills are really great. We built a well driller as well. Only problem is it was not designed for bedrock and large boulders, so we come to a crashing stop after we got down the way. We built a hydraulic water ram. We used a one and three quarter inch line, but time when you put a fitting inside of it, it's down to one and a half. So we do have water and we can feed the animals and the garden and different things. And when it runs 24 hours a day, it's a lot of water, but we want to make it work better. So on the next trip, we will increase the diameter of the line so we can get even more water. From the hydraulic water ram up over the hill to where we're putting the water in barrels in this day garden hole. This hydraulic water ram doesn't use any electricity or any motor. It just works on the power of the water. For every foot of elevation of the water, the hydraulic water ram will pump the water up seven feet. So you can raise it up quite a ways if you have a bit of a drop. This is a great system in the summer, but after it uh, gets cold in, in the winter and in Dees Lake, uh, it's going to freeze up. The next trip to Dees and out to 16 mile cabins, we'll be trying to put a bigger line in and make it even work more efficient. After a day being off the grid, it's nice to jump in the old hot tub and have a refreshing dip. Okay, back at the sawmill, I told you John was a good woodworker. I'll let you just look at their cabins that they put up here. We'll let you be the judge, but uh, I think he does very well. They have many guests come here and stay in the cabins from various different parts of the world. They are off the grid, so they are using solar panels, collecting power, that they, they can use to make the life there fairly comfortable. Plus they have a storage tank and running water. We found life very comfortable. And looking out the window, we've seen bears and we've seen link. Plus there seems to be quite a few foxes there as well and other smaller animals, just as they have uh, cabins that are quite large and other ones that are somewhat smaller, like this one here that you're looking at the bed here and other animals. Okay, we're going to have to be heading down to Telegraph Creek now, over the Telegraph Creek Road. We're uh, also interested in, is there a possibility somewhere down the road where we could take a riverboat to Wrangell, Alaska? This is my daughter here, and she's sort of the one running the business and looking after the animals, and I guess a few other things as well. And my wife is on the right, and she has a pink top on. We're just out spending some time at the cabins and enjoying ourselves, and then we're going to go on down to Telegraph and uh, spend some time there and check out the glaciers that's on its way down to Wrangell, Alaska. From Telegraph Creek down to uh, 
Wrangell, Alaska. I'm told there's some 300 glaciers that uh, we would be going by. Back in 1970, I used to drive this road, and I got to say that one day I spent all night there stuck in a mud hole. But it's a real famous road. I tell you, there's some big hills there. The road is much better now, so I wouldn't be too afraid of it. I met a First Nation in Telegraph Creek, and he says his nickname was You Bet Your Boots, so I will never forget that name. Years back, a group called the Wild Guys and ourselves, we canoed uh, the uh, Yukon River. I learned a lot about the Northwest Mounted Police, and then later the RCMP. They've contributed a lot to the development of the North, and I always had a lot of respect for them. They shouldn't be called uh, mounted police back then. I think they should have been mushers, because in the early days, they had dog teams. The first uh, vehicle we met, guess what? It was an RCMP officer. So we talked to him on the road for a little while. I believe he was from Poland or Russia and my wife from, was from Croatia, and they both could speak Russian. So guess what was going on on the road? Like I said, they're a great asset to the development of the North. Oops, it looks like it's all downhill from here. We'll find out. It was years ago when I used to cover it. Coming up, I think you're going to see, well, once we get down the hill, uh, you're going to see a building here, and a lot of the First Nations would come there, and they would have on the other side of the road, they would have smokehouse and smoking their salmon. I remember this house here, and First Nations were generally smoking fish right here. I didn't see the sm salmon smoking racks this particular time. They didn't have any department store there or anything close by, so you notice they have their own department store right at the front. It was really handy. At random spots, we would stop and uh, look over into the stikine, and then there was Telegraph. We were there. I used to see a horse. His head was quite a bit bigger than normal, and I watched for him all the time. I didn't see him this time. The horse looked very smart and was the leader of all the rest of them. About uh, a year and a half ago, I was in Telegraph, and they have an addition of a museum. I really enjoyed the museum and the work that went in to restore it. I used to stay at the Stikine River Song when I would go in there. That's where I met, you bet your boots. Just down the road from there, there was a sign on a tree, and it said, Toenail Avenue. Won't forget that one either. We'll bring Series 3 to an end, and then we'll come back and complete Series 4 on the inside passage where we're going to finish covering the Hubbard Glacier. We'll also cover the uh, Antarctica Glacier and the Greenland Glacier, some of the biggest and the fastest growing glaciers. I think this sign is a little outdated. That's for Glenora. But I just was going to show you that was the end of our trail there on the Stikine River. I hope to bring you the a series from going from Telegraph down to Wrangell, Alaska and the, all the uh, glaciers there at a later date. But anyways, we'll see you in Series 4. Thank you for coming along with us on our different cruises to various different uh, glaciers. We're going to cover the Glacier Bay now. Uh, we'll be covering Antarctic. We'll be finishing off the Hubbard cruise that we started out with as well and the Hubbard Glacier. I would also like to cover Antarctica because it has 91% of the ice on the Earth's surface and most of that is on the east side and it is actually still growing. This was in 2007, this particular trip that we took up the Inner Passage. And on this trip, we went into uh, Glacier Bay and spent some time there. We found that 95% of Alaska's 100,000 glaciers are thinning, stagnant, or retreating. But North America's glacial ice only amounts to about a half a percent of the Earth's uh, glacial ice. Antarctica's is 91% and it's growing.
The boundary of Canada and the United States contains the largest non-polar ice field in the world, as well as some of the world's longest and most spectacular glaciers. Polar ice is sheets of ice near the north and south of pole. And uh, this is where you have to have really cold weather. No heat down there. The eastern side of the Antarctic is known for their sheet ice. Known as the polar ice, Bear Glacier is not far from Stewart, British Columbia. After viewing Bear Glacier, go on into Stewart uh, as well. And then from Stewart, uh, you can go over to Hyder and up into Alaska ways and then back into Canada to the uh, Salmon Glacier. The record snowfall there is 1,100 inches and uh, they had a major catastrophe avalanche in Grand Duke and 26 people were killed and 17 was injured. This happened on February the 18th, 1965. We have covered most of that so I just give you a bit of a summary and we're now back uh, on the Hubbard Glacier and we'll be going back and covering that and looking at the calving that's taking place there. We will uh, continue to follow and monitor the Hubbard Glacier. The overcast sky is starting to clear up now, so we should have a good day watching the Hubbard. It's hard to have your camera on and running uh, in the right location because it's, there's a, a massive area that the Hubbard Glacier covers to uh, catch them when they're falling, but we're going to do our best. On the right hand side you're going to see uh, a small calving taking place of the screen. It should be coming out. You can generally see the water moving. There's, You see a little uh, whitened area there. You can see the water, come, the white coming out, the wave coming out. You know that the, the ice is coming down there now. That is going to be just the start of it. It looks like that uh, more uh, glaciers coming down. You see it coming down there right now. So. Uh, You'll be a period of time where you won't see a lot of activity, but you still hear the noise so you know things are moving. And then there'll be a period of time that there'll be a few of them coming down fairly closely together. Well, that wasn't the end of it either because there's more going to be more ice coming down there. Again, it looks like the very similar spot on the right hand side there. So just keep your eye open there and you should see, you see a wave uh, so you know that there's water and probably some of the ice coming down that can't, it's not noticeable, but there will be, and there, there you see some coming down right at that time. Why do I only get a few of the calvings? Well, the Hubbard Glacier is 76 miles long, seven miles wide, and 600 feet high. That's why when you're standing out on the, the deck of the cruise ship, you'll hear all kinds of noise, but uh, I've turned that down so you uh, are not able to uh, hear all the noise or else you won't be able to uh, hear anything that I'm saying. But I'll turn it up now and you can hear some of the noise as the glaciers come down. Well, you should see some ice coming down there. It comes there now again. So there's a fair amount that's coming down there. So when you really focus on one area, you find the area where there's some movement then uh, you'll notice that it continues a little more coming down at that particular time. So there is quite a bit of movement here. Looks like there's some more ice coming down now. If you watch the waves there, you can still see ice coming down and the wave going out. We hear a lot about the glaciers uh, thinning and melting, and yet at the same time you might ask, how many glaciers are there in Alaska? Well, there's over a hundred thousand. The biggest glacier in Alaska is the Bering Glacier near Cordova. And it is uh, 1,900 square miles. So it's a big one. You probably will wonder, is it growing or is it shrinking like a lot of the other uh, glaciers? <clears throat> and the answer is there, it both grows and it shrinks. It seems to change about every 20 years. The research that I checked out but overall it is uh, shrinking. According to the information that I did research on, and most of that was from Google. 
Then in Alberta, which is in Canada, they have about 800 glaciers. There is 17,000 glaciers in the province of British Columbia. When you see the number of glaciers that we have in Alaska and also in Canada and particularly in British Columbia, you'll think, wow, there's a lot of glaciers. When we uh, look at the glaciers we have in Canada and Alaska, you'd think, wow, most of the number of glaciers are here. But, but if you look at where all the glacier ice is, 91% of the ice is actually in the Antarctic. And in the east side, they are growing and they're the largest part. And in Greenland, it amounts to 8%. But in North America, it actually is less than a percent. It's 0.5%. And in Asia and the rest of the world, it wants out to about 0.1%. If we look at the actual numbers of glaciers, it'll give you one answer. But if you look at the amount of ice that there is in the earth, it'll give you a different answer. Some glaciers are very small and others are very big. I got my information from areas that I thought were reliable and uh, they gave me two different stories. So if you're on the side of the fact that the, uh, the glaciers are uh, melting then and we know that uh, the majority are, then you would go with the actual numbers. But if you were on the other side, you would go by the actual amount of ice that there was on the earth. Is it growing or is it receding of the glacial ice on earth? And that would be the Antarctica because those ones are growing, especially on the east side. The other factor you may want to look at is the polar ice, which is mainly uh, sheet ice, and it's near mostly the very north and south poles where it's very cold. You may be able to use that for whichever side you're on as to uh, whether you think it's growing or, or it's shrinking. We will be covering other glaciers and hopefully I'll be able to give you another report on them down the road. Mount St. Helens uh, is another mountain that uh, surprised me and that is uh, I think of uh, the volcano and the heat but now it's a fast growing glacier and it's expected to continue growing. I'm not sure how long. Overall the glacier I've seen in my lifetime which is 77 years they've been uh, shrinking. Mind you the glaciers I've seen have been smaller ones. Mind you years back it was the radio I listened to and uh, they were growing then but then we got the TV and now they're shrinking really hard. The fastest growing glacier in the world is in Greenland, and I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, but it, it's Hakosvin. This glacier flow is about 100 feet per day. Okay, we are in the inside uh, passage uh, in up in Alaska right now at the Hubbard Glacier. Uh, this one is a beautiful glacier, and it's uh, also growing. In July 2015, we were at the Denali Mountain, where you will find the fastest growing a glacier in Alaska called Moldo. It is growing anywhere from 10 to 100 percent faster than it usually does. It goes about three feet per hour. The last surge was in 1956 to 1957. The glacier that we have here at the Hubbard, it's uh, pretty noisy. You hear all the banging and crashing, so even though you don't always see all the calving, you certainly know it's moving by all the banging. Some of that sound that you're hearing, I'm sure, is also contributed to by the wind that's been blowing here. So you'll see uh, uh, hair blowing in the air on some spots down there. So there is some wind as well. Uh, you don't always see the calving, 
but we have a number of calvings that took place that we managed to be focused in the right place at the right time. We're going to now bring series number four to a close. We're just about done the Hubbard Glacier, and there's a few other glaciers we'd like to give you some information on.